Good morning. Um, good snowy morning. It is the morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on April 16th. And we are gathered here this morning to understand H449, which is a bill related to um, the creation of um, the uh, reconfiguration of the Vermont Pension Investment Committee to a commission and then the creation oh, of, a, Jesus um, of a task force to do some important work for the state of Vermont. We're joined by um, Representative John Gannon and Rob LeClaire from the House Government Operations Committee, as well as Ledge Council Rebecca Wasserman and JFO analyst Chris Roop. And we have about an hour um, or an hour and 15, maybe in minutes to begin becoming familiar with this and then we'll see where we go from there. So with that, let me turn this over to Representative Gannon um, to help us understand this. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you committee for having me in this morning um, to talk about this really important issue, which is how we can save our pensions. Um, I think you all know that there's $5.6 billion in unfunded liabilities today between um, the teachers, the state employees pensions and OPEP or retiree healthcare. Um, so House Government Operations um, has been looking at this issue now for what seems like several years, but is actually several weeks um, uh, to try to identify um, ways to solve this problem. Um, as some of you may know, we initially started um, with two proposals. Um, one was to, to shift the, the governance um, around our, our investments. Uh, and that was because, you know, there are two drivers to the unfunded liability um, today. One is missed actuarial assumptions, and the other is investment performance and missed inve assumed investment returns. Um, and so one of, that's why one of our focuses immediately um, was on VPIC and its governance structure, um, because we wanted to address the investment performance issue and the assumed rate of return issue. Um, so we did propose a governance change, um, and then we also uh, proposed benefit changes um, to the two pensions um, based on actuarial work that was conducted um, for our committee. Um, as you may know, we then held public hearings where we heard from literally hundreds of state employees and teachers um, who were very concerned about the speed of the work we were doing um, and urged us to form a task force um, to look at this issue of pension, of how we save our pensions over the summer. Um, so we took a step back. Um, uh, I, I also should say we, we heard from um, the chair of VPIC and the treasurer with respect to our governance proposals. And you know, we started working with them to come up with the, the governance proposal that's in front of you um, today. So based on you know, feedback from both you know, state employees and teachers and, and from the chair of VPIC and, and the whole VPIC board or committee and, and the treasurer, we ended up with the bill that is in front of you. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it balances um, moving forward with governance changes in VPIC. Uh, and there I'll focus on, we are moving from a, a seven, first of all, we're standing up an independent commission. Um, it, the, name of the, the name of VPIC is changing in the bill from the Vermont Pension Investment Committee to the Vermont Pension Investment Commission. And while one word change may not seem significant, um, it is significant that this bill sets forth making VPIC independent from the treasurer's office. And I think that is a critical change because we need to ensure that our investment decisions and how we set our assumed rate of return are based on independent investment information with respect to how we anticipate the markets will perform in the future. Um, the less politics that are involved with VPIC, I think the better off we are. I mean, you know, we should not be sitting our assumed rate of return um, in order to lower our ADAC payments. Um, we should be setting our assumed rate of return based on reality. Um, I think we've seen over the history 
uh, for the last 10 to 15 years that our assumed rates of return have been too high. Um, in many years, we have missed those assumed rate of return and that's added to our unfunded liability. So that's why we think that it's very important that BPIC be an independent voice with respect to picking our investments and setting the assumed rate of return. So a big change um, is how that assumed rate of return is set. Currently, it's set by not only VPIC, but the three retirement boards, v VSERS, VSTERS, and VMERS. Um, they all basically have a veto power over setting that assumed rate of return. Um, under the proposed, in the, in the language in the proposed bill, only VPIC will be responsible for that decision. Um, and for all decisions around setting the assumed rate of return, such as smoothing um, and other issues. Um, another addition to VPIC is independent investment experts. Currently, the VPIC statute doesn't require any investment expertise at all. Um, it does require training for VPIC members, um, but it does not require independent financial experts. And so the, the governor's appointments, there's two appoint, appointments by the governor, as well as an alternate, um, those positions will need to be independent experts going forward. And we think that's important. And if you look at the research out of the Boston College Center for Retirement, um, one of the things that's important to investment performance is investment expertise on your pension order or, or investment committee. Um, and so that's why we set that up. Um, the other thing that, that you know, th that's the big changes to the VPIC. We also add two employer representatives, um, one municipal employer and one school board employer or representative of those. Um, so that's, that's how it gets up to 10. Um, the other, I think, significant change um, that we did in VPIC is changing how often the experience studies are done. Um, the experience study basically determined how you're doing with your actuarial assumptions based on reality. Um, we currently do those every five years, um, and we are proposing this bill to do them every three years. Um, we think that this will ensure that our assumptions are, are closer to reality and that we're doing checks sooner than later. So if there are, if we are missing our assumptions, we can correct those changes on a, much more quickly. Um, so those, those are really the significant changes um, to VPIC. We also um, require reports um, as in statute. Some of those reports are already conduct, being conducted, but they're not required um, in statute. Um, I see Representative Fagan has a stand up. Yeah, uh, go, please, Rep Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rep Gannon, thank you for coming in. I, 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 I read this bill. Um, I think this is uh, you know, going to get us on a, uh, on a, on a path of, of making better decisions. Um, just a couple of, you know, just a couple of, as I would term it, nitnoid questions, but really important questions. Um, is VPIC, has VPIC been charged with fiduciary responsibility over the, over the fund? Uh, and will that fiduciary responsibility be, be transferred onto the new commission? The answer to, it, to, to both those questions is yes. Okay, good. Um, have they been trained in what a fiduciary, what that means? I believe, you know? yes, yes, they have. And one of the things that's in the bill is in the training section is that they will get not only investment training, um, but training with respect to their fiduciary duties. Good, thank you. Um, voting members, you, this, this new 10 uh, member commission, are they all voting members? The, the 10 members are um, all voting members, except for the chair who can only vote in a tie. Um, however, there are alternates also um, that are non-voting. Um, so if a member is absent, then the alternate would replace that member for a meeting and would have voting rights. Okay. Uh, do the um, do the labor representatives need to have investment experience in order to be elected to this? Uh, because if if they have and they walk in and they find out what their fiduciary responsibility is, it's going to be uncomfortable, but they can be okay. If they haven't, 
if they don't have investment experience, they walk in and they learn what fiduciary responsibility is. I, I, and, and that were me, I'd turn around and leave and say, no, thank you. Uh, this bill, um, nor, nor the current BPIC statute require um, the employee or the pension participant uh, representatives to have investment or fiduciary experience. Um, obviously, they will be trained. Um, one of the things that this bill does is require onboarding training um, so that hopefully they can get quickly up to speed. I, I should note that we are setting term limits um, in the bill. Um, however, um, based on our analysis of the current makeup of VPIC, um, only two members would term off um, after the transition period, which would be um, in 2023. So most of the participants, most of the members and alternates would still be participating and be allowed to be reappointed. So I don't see a big shift in institutional knowledge right away. Um, obviously over time now with term limits, um, there will be some, some change, but I think term limits is, is a best practice with respect to pension board um, governance as well as board governance in general. Um, but I don't think there'll be a, a huge shift right away in institutional knowledge on BPIC. Okay, thank you very much. I, re I really appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Representative uh, Jessup. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for coming in. Um, looking at page uh, four of the bill, and I'm on um, the version is introduced. I hope it's the right one. On line two, it talks about the um, financial expert being independent, which I totally agree with. And then it has though both of those independent experts appointed by one branch of government, which is the governor, the administration. And then in addition, you know, there's the commissioner of financial regulation. And my question is, was there any thought given to having just to, again, I think of it as disbursement of risk and responsibility. I view that as a positive to having one of those appointees come from some other uh, source? Sure. Um, so VPIC currently um, has the, the public members appointed by the governor. Um, we did not change that in this bill. Um, I think there was some brief discussion about whether there should be another appointing authority, um, but we chose to keep um, those appointments um, with, with the governor. Um, I think it's important um, that everybody have a stake um, in the decisions um, that we are making with respect to our, our pensions and that it's important that the governor um, uh, be you know, part of this process. And I, I'll say one thing that we shifted at the near, near the end was we had the commissioner for finance um, um, on VPIC, but we chose to move to the commissioner for financial regulation. And, and the reason for that is that you know the commissioner for financial for the Department of Financial Regulation um, is a securities regulator, um, and so has you know the securities regulatory expertise. And our our current commissioner, who may not be our commissioner forever, um, you know also you know worked for Scadden Arps, a law firm, and was in mergers and acquisitions. Um, so has you know a fairly good knowledge of of securities. Right. Like, for example, was it considered that the treasurer might appoint one of those independent? Well, one of the, the things that we are trying to achieve with respect to um, BPIC is its independence from the treasurer's office. We are attempting throughout this, these sections of the bill with respect to BPIC in ensuring that BPIC is independent um, and won't be pushed in one direction or another with respect to its investments or setting the assumed rate of return um, by politics. We have a terrific treasurer in office right now, um, but you know things may change as the treasurer pointed out in her own testimony. Um, and one of the goals that both the treasurer and BPIC supports is, is creating an independent commission to you know, make our investment decisions and set our assumed rate of returns. And can I continue, Madam Chair? It, yes. So also um, on page 15, um, as I understand it, and again, I'm like so many members trying to learn quickly about what is a complicated issue. 
the role of the actuary. And my question is, is that, I, my understanding is that's perhaps one individual versus a firm. And again, in the same thinking that I was applying to who chooses the independent person, disbursement, is, are there states or are there models out there where an actuary, there are two or three actuaries and they have to reach consensus? Um, that, that's a good question. And then we actually, and I specifically looked into this. Um, so typically you would only have one actuary um, rep being the independent actuary and it's typically a firm, not an individual. Um, right now we have Siegel as our actuary and they've been our actuary since I believe 2018, um, which it was a good change um, since they were not responsible for many of the um, incorrect actuarial assumptions. Um, but there is a, a, a process where you could have an actuarial audit done. Um, we actually talked to our state auditor about this. Um, he couldn't conduct it on his own. He would have to retain um, an independent actuary of his own to do it. Um, but you could have a second actuary on a periodic basis look at the work of uh, the, the actuary who actually does the experience studies. Um, thank you. So I see Jim's hand and I'll call on him in a second. What I'd like to do is suggest that we allow Representative Gannon to get through his broad overview of the bill and then we can come back down into our um, questioning around the particulars of the bill. But I opened the door, so let me let Representative Harrison through the door and then I'm going to shut it. Rep Harrison. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, Representative Gannon, uh, the VPIC, new VPIC uh, makeup, I, I think the addition of the DFR commissioner is an excellent one. Uh, given what they do um, for a living over there. Um, I, but I, I'm questioning what, what do um, the members representing uh, municipal employers or school employers or uh, the union members add to uh, the investment um, expertise uh, at the table? Um. That's a very good question, Rep Representative Harrison. I, I don't know if they, they add investment expertise per se, but one of the things, if you look at the, the, the Boston College Center for Retirement Research on board composition, one of the things that they recommend and that research has shown is important is that all stakeholders be represented um, on, on a pension board or on an investment committee like this. Because while they may not bring a, a wealth of investment experience, they bring buy-in um, from the various stakeholders, which I, I think based on our public hearings and what we heard through those is critically important um, for VPIC to be a success. All right, um, thank you. So I, I guess what I'm hearing from you on uh, overall, you would consider, consider this fair and balanced. That is what we try to achieve with both VPIC and our task force. Um, and yeah, you know, it just, it just criticize that, but uh, I believe that we that we focused on having representatives from the three stakeholder groups that are important on VPIC, and I think that this, the the task force, in its current form, is, is extremely balanced. So I shouldn't expect any more emails with that title, then. I, I can't promise you that, member. All right, thank you. So let us let Rep. Gannon um, continue walking us through the report. We haven't even gotten to the task force yet. I think you left off in describing um, your reporting requirements. Um, right. Um, Nick. So we, we have put in statute um, many of the reporting requirements that are currently being conducted by VTIC. Um, and you know, we shifted, I already mentioned we shifted the experience study from five to three years. I mean, I think that, that's a, a pretty good overview of VPIC. I mean, there's a lot of details. Um, for example, um, the term limits are important. We changed the quorums. Um, one of the things that we did with respect to changing the quorums is we do require a supermajority um, for setting the assumed rate of return. 
Um, I think that's important that we have buy-in um, from a larger group of people with respect to that. Um, one of the things that was important and is a significant change is legislators cannot serve on VPIC. Um, we heard that from many voices. We need to depoliticize this process. And so we cannot have people on VPIC who may be setting the assumed rate of return simply to lower our ADAC payment. That is not how it, I believe it should be set. Um, so I think that's an important change. Um, so VPIC will be funded um, from collecting funds from the three retirement plans to cover its expenses and any expenses that the treasurer's office incurs in supporting the work of VPIC. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the task force, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, so section 10 of the bill creates a 15 member task force comprised of six legislators, three from the House and three from the Senate, um, chosen by the Speaker and the Committee of Committees in the Senate, three state officials, the Commissioner for Financial Regulation, the Commissioner of Human Resources, and the Re Director of Retirement, who's in the Office of the Treasurer. Um, we thought she was a, a key person to have on this because she is the expert in the treasurer's office with respect to re retirement benefits. Um, she really understands the difference between the various groups within VSERS, um, which is an issue that, you know, I think the task force is gonna have to tackle. And I'll go into that in a minute. Um, and then we have six members chosen by labor organizations, um, the Vermont NEA, the VSEA, and the Vermont Troopers Association. So as you can see, I mean, there's six legislators, three state officials and six members of labor, labor organizations. So we're trying to balance between employers and unions and the legislature. And the legislature represents both state employees and teachers as well as Vermont taxpayers. And we think, you know, because we will be tackling this next year with whatever recommendations the task force comes out, out with, it's very important that legislators um, be part of the task force. Um, the, tar the task force will have its first meeting on honor before June 15th and hold up to 15 weekly meetings um, and will submit a written report to the governor and the House and Senate Government Operations Committee on or before September 1st, 2021. The task force will, will make recommendations about benefits and appropriate funding sources, including setting a stabilization target number. And actually in the bill, we have set that stabilization target number. Um, I think that's important and I'd be glad to go into more detail about that. Um, it's gonna conduct a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates and three, five and 10-year projections of those levels and rates. Um, it's going to look at benefit and funding benchmarks and propose new benefit structures with the objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks, including an evaluation of shared risk models for employee contributions and cost of living adjustments. That's new. Right now, there is no risk sharing between employers and employees. Um, it's gonna estimate the cost of current and proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay as you go, as well as a full actuarial accrual basis. It's going to evaluate the intermediate and long-term impacts to the state and local economies of benefit changes and their potential impact on retiree spending. It's going to evaluate any cross subsidization between groups within VSERS and adjusting contribution amounts to eliminate cross subsidization. Um, just a quick word on that. Um, there was a lot of questioning about whether there was cross subsidization between the various groups within the VSERS plan. We requested from the treasurer's office information on that. We did not obtain that information um, for whatever reason. Um, but we think it's important to determine one way or the other whether in fact there is cross subsidization. Because if you look at the, 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 the plans, um, the benefits, especially in group D are, are much more, uh, which, what's the word, I, are better than they are for say group F, which is the largest has the largest number of participants or, or even group C. So I think it's at least worth looking into that. Um, the, the task force is gonna evaluate alternative plan design, such as hybrid or defined contribution options, 
or a defined contribution and defined benefit combination. It's going to examine permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund VSERS and VSTERS and review all or part and, and review whether all or part of retirement income should be tax exempt. Um, and finally, it's going to develop a plan to prefund OPEP healthcare costs, including reviewing healthcare benefit design innovations, state regulatory measures, and alternative methods of providing pooled healthcare benefits. And I will say one thing uh, while most of the focus in our committee and, and has been on pensions, I, I do think that retiree healthcare is a place we need to look to reduce the overall cost, costs and reduce our unfunded liability. I think a lot more work can be done there um, to reduce our overall costs. Um, so I think that's really an important thing for the, the task force to do. Um, the task force will not make any recommendations on adjusting the assumed rate of return. That is in VPIC's ball court. Um, and we think it's important because that would basically be financial gamesmanship for the task force to recommend changing the assumed rate of return. We've had enough of that over the last several years. Um, I don't think we wanna go down that path anymore. Um, the task force will seek stakeholder input before it makes its final recommendations. It will solicit input through public hearings and reach out to affected stakeholders, including representatives of the judicial branch, group D members, and VSERS members who are employees of the Department of Corrections. Um, as you may know, um, there is a bill that's on our wall currently that would propose shifting to some um, Department of Corrections employees who are in facilities um, to a new, what they call Group G plan um, that would have earlier retirement. Um, so that is something perhaps the task force can take a look at. There is a cost to that. Um, so, I mean, and I realize that, but at least we can take a look at that. Um, the task force will be supported by the treasurer's office, receive fiscal assistance from joint fiscal office. And I'll say one, I just want to do a call out to Chris Roop. I mean, Chris Roop and joint fiscal has been incredible in assisting our committee in getting through this. And um, his, his knowledge has been invaluable um, to our committee. Um, you know, we will also get support services from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, the task force will contract for advisory services. And these advisory services are sort of two things. Um, for an actuary um, who can look at our, our benefit decisions or recommendations initially and determine how much they cost or how much they save. Um, we also need an outside legal expert um, to look at legal issues around any benefit changes we make. Um, as you may know, um, well, you know, there is a contractual component to some benefits um, and you have to be careful with respect to what you can do without getting an agreement from the unions with respect to those benefits. Um, that was done in 2009 with the Retirement Commission. They hired an outside legal expert to give them um, recommendations about what can and cannot be done um, unilaterally um, by the legislature with respect to benefit changes. Um, so I think that's important. And so that the cost for, for those outside experts will be um, $200,000. Um, and that is basically the bill. Thank you, Representative Gannon. I am wondering if you will go back to the list of responsibilities established for the task force and um, elaborate a, a bit more. You ran through the list um, and we're not as familiar as you with that. And I think we need to linger and see what particular questions we have. One that has come up is what does cross subsidization mean? But, um, it, so if you could just cut, go back to that and, and understand that more deeply. So the first, so the first task is, is setting a pension stabilization target number. And we actually identified what that should be um, in uh, the bill. And it's to reduce the actuarial accrued liability based on actuarial value of assets by a sum equivalent to the amount of the increase from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 in the state employees and teachers pensions. 
and also to reduce the actuarial determined employer contributions by a sum of equivalent to the amount of the increase from financial from fiscal year 2021 to fiscal 2022 um, in the, the teachers and state employees pensions. And, and let me let me explain that one because that's really an important um, thing. Uh, you know, Chris Roop did a great presentation for us. Um, you know, it's important to focus on both the liabilities and budgetary pressures. If you only focus on one, you could have very poor, poor results. For example, if we just focus on budgetary pressures, we could, for example, and this is only an example, reamortize um, the, two, the two pensions. Well, that would reduce the ADAC payments. It would increase our unfunded liability. Um, so just focusing on budgetary pressures could have unintended results in increasing our unfunded liabilities. So we thought it was very important that both liabilities and budgetary pressures um, be, be, be the focus of any target. Um, we wanted to establish a numerical target um, so that that was before the task force already identified so they could begin their work immediately. Um, so I think it's very important to look at those things in, a, in assessing the, the full picture. Um, and we also wanted to set achievable or targets because that was one of the things. You could look at just unfunded liability and say, oh, let's reduce unfunded liability by 2 billion. Um, that, you know, we, we talked with Chris Roop about that and you know that just seemed hard to achieve and why we chose the numbers that we did is there's a lot of actuarial research that the treasurer's office did with respect to to trying to move back to fiscal year 2021 you know much of the work that we did in house government operations um, was focused on you know sort of the same goals so that's why we chose um, these targets um, for, for the task force. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the next task, the task force um, was conducting a, a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates, and then project them out for three, five and 10 years. Um, this shouldn't take too long because we already know what the contribution levels have been for the last several years. Um, Chris Roop did a good, has a great presentation that explains that. Um, but what we haven't done is, is project those out, um, especially with any benefit changes um, that the task force may propose. Um, uh, then, you know, it's looking at new benefit structures. And this is where the real hard work will be is, is, is what, and we've done a lot of work in our committee on that as, as our, as I mentioned, our initial proposal um, did look at benefit changes. Um, and so we do have a lot of information and data on that, um, which I think can help the task force move quickly through looking for new benefit structures, you know, changing cost of living, um, changing, you know, ch changing retirement age or whatever other recommendations um, it chooses to come up with. So there is work done in that area. Um, one of the things that I think is important is looking at a shared risk model. Um, with respect to employer employee contributions or cost of living adjustments. Right now, each year, the state plays, pays more and more um, for contributions, whereas teachers and state employees do not. Um, so one thing to think about or the, that the task force should think about is whether there can be risk sharing with respect to those contribution amounts, because the state just keeps paying more, whereas the the state employees and the teachers do not. Um, that can also be, cost of living adjustments can also be done on a risk sharing basis and be either set to what, meeting our investment performance or some other measure. Um, next is just evaluating the intermediate and long-term impacts to the state and local economies of benefit changes and their potential impact on retirees. Um, this, propo this, uh, this proposed language actually came from Jeff Bannon from Vermont NEA, and I think it's important that we do, that the task force looks at, if we do make benefit changes, what are the long-term and intermediate impacts to the state and to our local economy? 
because retirees um, from the state and from teachers mostly stay in Vermont. I think 80% of them stay in Vermont. Um, we wanna make sure um, that we are not doing anything that will require them to, to fall into our social safety net um, and will allow them um, to continue to have, uh, make a good living through their pension and social security. Um, the other thing I'll get back now, the next thing they have to do is look at cross subsidization. Um, I, I wish I could tell you more about this, except that we, we kept hearing references to the fact that there is cross subsidization in VSERS between the various groups. And if you just compare, for example, the benefits in group D. Um, so a group D is a small group. It's basically the judges um, in the Vermont court system. Um, but if you look at their benefits compared to the other groups in VSERS, um, they get 100% of their final salary. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so I mean, compared to you know, the other groups who don't get anywhere close to that. Um, there's no averaging of their last three years uh, of their salary or anything like that. So we're, we're just, you know, going to explore that. There is some dated information that there is cross subsidization. Um, and so I think it's important that each group within VSERS support itself. Um, that, you know, the contributions being made um, support that so that there isn't another group that's doing that. So that's cross subsidization. Um, I see Representative Fagan has his hand up. I'm, I'm not going to call on him. I want you to get to the end of the list and then I'll call on people. <laughs> okay. Um, so next is evol evaluating alternative plan design. Um, you know, this came up in our committee. Um, you know, some of our members wanted us to look at, you know, defined contribution plans or a hybrid plan or a combination um, DC, DB plan. Um, I will have to say, you know, having looked at what happened in West Virginia, who went from a DB plan to a DC plan, um, it actually cost the state more money to do that. Um, but we think that the task force should look at that. Uh, perhaps West Virginia did it wrong. Um, and there is a way uh, to do it correctly. Um, so that's on the table to look at. And the other thing that we may wanna look at is should there be in addition to the DB plan, um, a DC plan that people can participate in. So I think they already have that. So um, that's, on, that's it on plan design. Um, so the next thing is examining permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund VSERs and VSTERs. Um, I think you all know that there's been a lot of discussion um, of either creating a wealth tax or, or some other tax um, um, to help fund the pension system. So, I mean, the task force can look at what um, might be an appropriate permanent or temporary revenue stream for VSERS and VSTERS. Um, the other thing that, that we didn't hear a lot of discussion about that we considered and it came up on the floor yesterday is, is whether um, retirement income should be tax exempt. Um, and is that another way if we do change benefits um, to keep our state employees and teachers whole? Um, so we think that it's important to at least look at that and consider what the cost, it, it may be less of a cost to the state to do that. Um, so, uh, but I think Representative Ansel can, can tell you more about that than I can. Um, uh, and then, the, the final task and an important one is developing a plan to pre-fund OPEP. Um, as I think you all know, and as the tre treasurer has re repeatedly reminded us, um, pre-funding OPEP can save $1.68 billion. Um, so that is an important consideration to make. Um, now, a lot of people, you know, there, as you well know, there's $150 million set aside um, to address our pension problems. You know, some people are asking, why don't we use some of that money right now to pre-fund OPEP? And my response to that is, I really believe that it's important that the task force not have its arms tied um, with respect to its decisions and that it should guide the legislature 
or make recommendations to the legislature as how that $150 million should be spent. Um, yes, this may add some to our unfunded liability between now and when the task force, or I should say the legislature, um, drafts a bill. Um, I, I think it's important that the task force be given the opportunity to make its recommendations and identify what is the best place for that $150 million. So those, those are really the tasks um, that are in the bill with respect to the task force. Thank you for returning to that list and helping us better understand that. Bunch of hands now, Representative Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Rep, Rep Gannon, thank you. You, just, you absolutely just answered one of my questions, which was on the $150 million, um, you know, should we go ahead and invest it now? And, and thank you for saying that. We know all about creating temporary reserves, so we'll be able to handle that. Um, regarding the, the cross-subsidization, um, so obviously the, the, uh, the pension fund itself is not meant to be um, um, uh, each part. There's not a set amount for, for one group, set amount for one group, set amount for one group, although it's kind of looked at a little bit in that regard. Um, the issue here is that you've got some individuals uh, receiving far higher uh, pension benefits, yet paying in the same amount as everyone else uh, as far as a percentage of salary? Uh, so, sort of, maybe not the exact same amount, but the, the question is, you know, are there employee contributions and are employer contributions covering the cost of the benefits they receive? Sure. Um, or is another group subsidizing those benefits? Okay. And thank you. And then the... Um, the final question just escaped me, so I may put my hand up again, Madam Chair, when I remember it. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me, I, I beg your pardon, Representative LeClaire, I should have asked if, um, in addition to welcoming you, if, if, if you wanted to add to this presentation, I beg your pardon for not turning to you no. first. <laughs> Not at all, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I, I think the only thing I'd say is, didn't I do an excellent job of preparing the member from Wilmington for this? <laughs> <laughs> Such a good job that I forgot to call on you. So well done. I'll, I'll yeah. jump in if I feel it's appropriate, but thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think Representative Iacoboni was next, but I could well be wrong. Sorry. Thank you. Me. No, you, you spotted me. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. This is not a criticism. I'm seeking your rationale and explanation. Um, in, on page 23 of 27, it says, uh, double I, it says the employer contribution will be reduced for a certain period of time. So my, my question is, I'm seeking your explanation. If an employee were to say to me, um, representative, why, why should I, as an employee, shoulder 100% of that reduction when I'm not responsible for 100% of the problem? Uh, that's the first. How would you help me uh, explain that? Well, I think, um, you know, and, and Chris Roop can show you the slides on this. Um, employer contributions have been increasing. Um, tremendously over the last several years, whereas employee contributions have not. Um, so I, I think that in order to solve that problem, and I think it is a problem. I, I mean, the more employer contributions go up, the more the pensions cost us, is, is that there needs to be um, an analysis of what is a fair um, level of of employer contribution versus employee contributions. So you've made that in a sense already in this language because you're saying they've got to pick up all of that fiscal year. It's a hundred million dollars, I believe. That is a target. Okay, okay. Um, I guess that's open then for a discussion. But my other question is, um, would you welcome some uh, guardrails to the task force along the lines of if there shall be a recommendation 
for an increase in retirement age, it will not apply to those within 10 years of retirement? Um, that, that's a, a very good question, um, Representative. Um, that is something that in our initial proposal with respect to benefit changes in House GovOps, um, we, we did put two guardrails in place, one that retirees would not be impacted by any benefit changes, and two that people within five years of retirement would not be impacted um, by benefit changes. So that is something that we did consider. Um, and you could put in those guardrails. I will just say the more guardrails you put in, the more difficult it will be for the task force to, to come up with recommendations to meet the targets. Thank That's you. The downside. There's an upside, there's a downside. Yes, appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, member. I, <clears throat> Let's see, I think Representative Helm, but actually, Re Rep LeClaire, you put your hand up in response to that yeah. question, I believe, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanna to add to this in that um, timing is of the essence here. And like the representative from Wilmington said, we didn't wanna put um, a lot of conditions on this because currently the teacher's pension right now um, is hemorrhaging to the tune of about $13 million a month. So this is an issue that timing is very, very important. And if you just do the math, the 150 million that we have set aside, um, if we took a year to address this issue, not only would that $150 million have really done nothing, we'd still be $6 million more added to the, to the deficit. So we were looking to make this as quick and <laughs> I guess the, not, the right word isn't easy, but as productive as we could. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Helm. Can I spin away from this or is somebody else wanna, I, I wanna go into a little different section of this. All right. Um, let, let us stick with the, with the task force duty for a bit. Okay. So is go that- ahead. Yep. Okay. I'll be um, here. Okay. Yes, you will. Thank you. <laughs> um, Rep Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to both uh, Rep Scan and, and LeClaire for coming and explaining this all to us. Um, my question uh, popped into my head as you were, as you reached letter D among the uh, tasks of the task force. Um, evaluating the economic impacts. Were, were you, di, did you folks hear or did you folks discuss any possibility of including as a task um, evaluating the um, evaluating the potential impact on the ability of uh, the, the state with regard to state employees or uh, the education world in terms of teachers, the ability, the impact on the ability to attract and retain personnel. Um, yes, Representative Townsend, we had discussion in our committee about that. Um, there were concerns um, about that. And we believe within D, we sort of capture um, that, um, you know, looking at the, the economic impacts can include the ability to retain either teachers or state employees. Um, so that's sort of captured in that subsection, I would argue. And then we had that discussion in our committee and we thought that this, this covered those issues. So, so that would, could be read as the legislative intent of that, those words. Yes, absolutely, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Representative Faltas. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am befuddled by the first task, the number A of setting a pension stabilization target number. Can you explain that in just plain old layman's terms? Does that mean we don't want to spend, actually spend a finite amount of money? above a particular target? 
and you're going to do it by these two different methods or does what does that mean can, so, can you explain it better for me please yeah so this this subsection ties the fiscal target to the size of the increase in liabilities in ADAX from FY21 to FY22. Um, these increases were driven mostly by recent changes in demographic and economic assumptions, including lowering the assumed rate of return. So for VSERS, those targets translate to reducing 36 million on the ADAC and 225 million on the liability. For VSERS, those targets translate to reducing 60 million on the ADAC and 379 million on the liability. So, so does this mean you don't want to go beyond those numbers or that, I'm sorry, I still don't understand. Yes. You're gonna say yeah. no, we're you, not gonna go beyond the particular You have it right, Representative Feltz. Okay. So we don't intend to spend beyond that increase that occurred just recently, irrespective of whatever some of the other um, analysis shows. That, that's correct. And, and I think we are in a very good place with respect to our assumed rate of return right now. Um, I think, you know, for many years, um, our assumed rate of return was over, overly optimistic. I would anticipate when we finish this fiscal year um, that we will um, have an actuarial gain um, on our investments. Um, that is in part due to market timing of where our market was at the beginning of the fiscal year and where it hopefully will end at the end of the fiscal year. So I think we're in good state, state there. And I see that Chris Roop has appeared, so he may have some information um, to share too. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative. Again, I, just to, to add a, a minor point of clarity to, to, to your question was, you know, I, I think the, the state, I, I think realistically numbers are gonna increase from year to year between now and the end of the amortization period. And they're gonna increase due to payroll growth and they're going to increase due to, um, you know, the, the fact that the statutory amortization schedule calls for the unfunded liability amortization payments to go up by 3% every year. And the thinking with that was, you know, if the budget or the payrolls assume they grow up by 3% every year, this would kind of maintain a steady, a steady slice of the pie. Um, I think the intent with this was to look at the, the size of that increase from year to year and use that size as the target value. So I, I just want to clarify that, you know, realistically, I, I don't think we would keep all costs at FY21's levels from now until FY2038 because things are still going to increase as payroll goes up. But this is more about how do you sort of lower the floor of those increases a little bit? So they're back in line with where they would have been um, before the recent changes of assumptions that led to such big jumps in costs from last year to this year. Thank you, that helps. Thank you. Um, Representative Shai. Thanks, I'm gonna wait till the end. I'm gonna just keep my hand up, but I'd like to come back at the end for my question. Okay. It's not this directly. Oh, it's gonna be a good one then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Gannon, in terms of the duties and responsibilities of this task force, um, ideally, I guess at the end of the day, there is some kind of grand bargain. You know, the state does X, the employees uh, at maybe at different age groups do Y or Z or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, we can, you know, endorse it next year. But are there any limitations uh, to, you know, you talk about, you know, plan for prefunding OPED. Um, you know, I look at these things, it's all a liability right now. That's how we get to the 5.7 plus billion dollar liability. It's OPED plus the regular pension. Is there anything that, you know, in the give and take world that we can do, um, you know, the parties can agree to something on OBED um, and then, but, you know, in exchange, there's something else that's done on the uh, retirement age. Uh, is there anything that limits any of that conversation or discussion? Um, thank you, Rep Rep Representative Harrison, for that question. Um, so, 
I think if this plays out similar to how the 2009 Retirement Commission um, played out, what will happen is that the task force will make recommendations. Um, then if it recommends benefit changes um, that impact um, uh, vested employees, there would likely have to be negotiation um, between the state. And um, last time that was done, it was with the Speaker of the House, um, the Senate um, President Pro Tem, the Treasurer and the Governor um, to negotiate with the unions with respect to benefit changes. Um, and then a package um, came to the legislature to approve. Um, but there are things that we can do unilaterally. We have a lot more flexibility with respect to OPEP um, than benefit changes. Um, with respect to new hires, um, we have the flexibility to make our own decisions with respect to them. Um, and even with respect to some benefits, um, we may have some flexibility um, to act unilaterally. I'm not sure that answered your question, but I think that's what you were trying to ask. Yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, if I did, I'd give it to you and say, here you go. Uh, and everybody's happy and, and we are going to erase that liability. It's not simple. Uh, and I appreciate all the work um, your committee has done uh, in the, probably the body armor that you've had to wear for the last uh, few months. Um, but um, the other part, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, looking at um, – revenue sources to add to the mix. Um, is there anything that prevents them from saying instead of, you know, additional revenue, um, we reallocate some of the current spending? Um, obviously, that's not easy, um, but could that be part of the mix as well? Reallocate it where? And our budget. Um, Madam Chair, I think you're muted. I I, I was asking him to clarify too. I, what, what do you mean, Jim? Well, I mean, we spend, you know, whoever billion dollars on a whole variety of programs. Um, if this is considered by the legislature uh, to be a priority, what's to prevent us from saying, okay, we need to spend an extra 50 million um, instead of raising taxes um, which may not be palatable to some of us, um, what's to say we couldn't reduce spending in uh, certain areas of government? Isn't that our job every year to ask and answer those questions? I mean, you know, as we develop- Yeah, yeah no, I guess it is. I just didn't know in terms of the task force whether or not they would be, um, you know, instead of, you know, increasing, Proposing an increase in income taxes, for example, or some other tax that, you know, maybe they come back with a recommendation to reallocate. Uh, yes, it is our, our responsibility and our job. Thank you. Um, I, I, let's see, uh, Representative Helm, you wanted to take us in a different direction. Whoop, you're muted, Bob. Oh, come on. There we there go. There you are. Gotcha. A little bit, not that much, but you know, uh, and, and I'm going to go into an area I don't know anything about, which isn't uncommon. However, <laughs> I have always stayed away from unions by luck and by choice at the same time. However, at one time I got, I was a, a select board member and a, a new one. And so they made me the negotiator with the union. I had no idea what I was doing and they knew I did. <laughs> and they played the time game with me. I was a working guy, you know, I'm doing things. I've got a family and I, this guy comes in, great guy. Anyways, he sat me out and they got what they wanted. And I said, boy, is that how that works? Now I'm going to get to where I need to go. I, all the years I've sat here with this whole um, union thing and, and negotiations every year, daddy, or not every year, but almost, um, 
I, I wonder why do we, we appear to me that we, the government, the governor's office really um, loses every year. I believe the governor has somebody come out of the Department of Labor to negotiate. I'm not sure if he's a negotiator or she is, but I do know one thing, even back when we were getting discharged from the state house due to COVID, they had, we were right into it at that time. And there, there had been, I thought, another very favorable to the union members um, agreement, which included, as I recall, a, a check to be sent to every one of them. And I never got the, under, the total br brief on it because we, we'd left and everything kind of dissolved for a while. Anyways, um, my point is, is there any look or will there be from, from this proposal at us dealing with our union negotiations? I, th I believe we need to deal a little more directly and seriously. Now, maybe I'm wrong. And if I am, I hope somebody can show me that. But my point is, I think we give away the farm. Uh, more than we need to. And, I, and I'm not trying to get at union people. I don't care. They, they've got their thing and they deserve it. But I just say what's fair is fair. And I, I'd like to try to keep it that way. It, it, can you come close to answering that, John? Uh, I, I can try. Um, I, I don't think it's the role of the task force um, to negotiate um, with our unions. Um, the unions will have representatives on the task force. And ideally, I would hope that the, the task force could reach consensus recommendations um, with respect to any benefit changes or, or any other recommendations it makes. Um, now, when the Retirement Commission met back in 2009, um, it, it, it did not have any union representatives on it. So union representatives will have a say in what the task force does, um, but ultimately it will be up to other people to negotiate um, with the unions if it's necessary um, to make any changes that the task force proposes. Well, if you don't try to tighten the strings, and I see Maida is sitting there very antsy. If you don't try to tighten the strings, the strings get loose and that's just the way it is. And I'm not saying the task force should be in, in, in involved in, in that, but they, if they're going to truly be a task force, they should have a, a, some concern with the process. A absolutely. And I think, you know, that's why I think there is a good balance on the task force um, to hear from all the stakeholders. Um, so unlike the last time we did this, which was, I think, a mistake, um, we do have a union represent, representation um, that will be working on this. I do think there's hard negotiations that are ahead. Um, and the representative of Claire has his hand up. Yeah, I see that too, but let me just put my two cents in. Let's don't conflate the question about around retirement benefits and the overall issue of how we compensate employees. One is a subset of the other and um, it, 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 period. And if one has a concern with how the um, governor is negotiating with the union. Um, I mean, to me, that is a separate, you know, that, that biannual conversation is a separate discussion to what we are doing here. And we, we need to not confuse the two, the two issues. I, I broadly uh, yeah. understand you, you're raising a point of view, but I, I'm just wanting to separate the two issues. I, I, I get what you're saying. However, if you, if you, if you don't fix or, or, or at least work on fixing the whole problem, you aren't going to get where you, maybe you need to go. That's all I'm saying. Representative LeClaire, did you want to add to this? 
Um, I can briefly there, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I understand where the, the member's coming from. However, we did want to keep this focused primarily on the pensions and, and the OPEB, because as somebody who has dealt with organized labor for decades in a variety of fashions, there is an awful lot that gets drawn into the collective bargaining discussions. Um, and we wanted to make sure this was focused exclusively around those basically two items. Because uh, it's in itself, this is going to be very contentious and a lot of work is going to have to go into to affect the change that's going to stabilize these pensions and put them on a trajectory where there's long term faith in their stability. Thank you. Um, okay. Representative Shy, are you ready for your. <laughs> Yeah, I just didn't want to interrupt the flow of the other conversation. Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Rep Gannon and LeClaire and the whole GovOps committee. This is, um, you guys did incredible work on this and I just really appreciate this. And it's, it's um, the bill is great. Um, so my question is, we have this great bill. Where is the Senate on this? Have they been in part of any of these discussions? Um, I'm just kind of worried what's going to happen when it leaves our body. Um, so yesterday, um, House and Senate leadership and the chairs of House GovOps and Senate GovOps met um, to discuss the bill. Um, this afternoon, the chair and I will be in Senate GovOps walking through um, the bill. So there have been discussions um, and we will be presenting the bill this afternoon in Senate, Senate GovOps, even though we are aware that appropriations may amend it, um, at least um, Senate GovOps will get a good head start in at least understanding the direction um, that we're headed. Okay, but no sense of how they're feeling about this at this point. Um, I think they're aware of the problem and the work that we've done. Um, and so it's my hope um, that they will um, follow through with the concepts that we've put into our bill. Great, okay. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. Um, Representative Jessup. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a question, but before I get to it, I just want to make a, a couple comments. Um, on, the, on the issue of process, um, one of my biggest concerns is what kind of process led us to the legislature underfunding this for so long, which is why we landed here. So I just wish to put that on the table. And the other comment that I wish to make is I think um, Representative Iacovoni raised an excellent point about uh, little sub two on page 23. He used the term guardrails and, and uh, that resonates with me um, for any number of reasons, which I won't go into right now. But my question, has to do with uh, OPEB and pre-funding. Um, here's what I'm struggling with. On the one hand, we have what I understand to be fairly uh, defined targets. There were some numbers read out, which actually I'd love to get those in reading, uh, in writing rather. And yet on the other hand, we're told we don't want to tie the hands by dedicating this 150 million despite the fact that these uh, numbers keep increasing uh, day by day, month by month, as we heard. So I'm just trying to balance those two tensions and I'm having a hard time doing that. If someone could help me. Well, I, I mean, I think it was important um, to have targets for the task force um, because I mean, in order to finish their work by September to first, I, I think, taking that off the table because we could have said, okay, task force, you set the targets. Um, we decided in House GovOps that it was important that we set the targets um, to take that task off the task force responsibilities. Um, so I, I think, you know, that that is important to have that sort of guardrail around it. Um, as far as the, the 150 million goes, uh, I mean, we do not know what direction the task force will go with respect to OPEP um, or the pensions. Um, the way the treasurer's recommendations um, were designed was that, you know, 
by well prefunding OPEB will cost us money. She hoped to make up that cost in savings and changing the pension benefits. Um, so I think you have to balance all of that um, before you make a determination of how to spend the $150 million. Is how where where are the savings going to come from? Um, and that will help identify where the money should be spent. And I think you know spending the money now um, may restrict what decisions um, the task force can make um, throughout the process. Okay, I'm, I might not be understanding because. I'm if, sorry. Maybe if I so, is, no, no, um, you're doing a great job. This is um, unfamiliar terrain to to me as an appropriator, and I'm not speaking for anyone else here. I, I'm still not following, if you have a debt that is accruing on a time basis, why, if the whole purpose of the task force is to deal with a substantial liability, depending how you frame it in budgetary terms or any other terms, I don't understand why lessening those pressures upstream is incongruent with what you are asking the task force to do. I'm still not getting that. Well, Representative Jessup, we could spend the $150 million, million dollars right now reducing our unfunded liabilities. That is not gonna necessarily solve any problems um, if we don't identify how we're gonna achieve savings by using that money. I mean, I mean we, we could just point, uh, Representative LeClaire has his hand up. So. Maybe, maybe he, Rob right. can help us, yeah. Um, those are excellent questions. I, I think what the intent was is to first identify what the real issues are. For instance, like the OPEB, the $20 million to pre-fund it. That's based on some assumptions of, I think an initial, investment of like the 20 million and then 10% and then a three and a half percent. But you don't have to look too far to understand it. Healthcare costs are increasing at double digits. So is the 20 million really enough or should there be more? On the other hand, we've heard uh, for like the teacher's pension, which like I had said is, is hemorrhaging money every month, maybe of the 150 million, 90 million should be allocated exclusively to that. So until you can really quantify exactly what the problems are and what some of the potential solutions are, you're better off to take a pause and figure out if there's a better place to put that money that'll have a greater effect up front. Does that, does that help or make any sense? Yeah, it does. And I also wonder, and again, uh, this is my, my last point. I'm not trying to belabor this. Um, here in House Appropriations, depending what happens with future funding streams, what we may want to think about in terms of set-asides, that's just a, an, another place to go. And appreciating, that does help, in terms of appreciating ultimate use of that set-aside is, is what you're getting at. And I, I think I understand that now. But yeah. I still... Um, I don't want those dollars, if they can be used to address what I see as a fundamental responsibility of ours, to somehow get swept for all the many good causes that come into this committee every single day. And that's my concern. Sure. I, I might add just briefly, and then you folks would know this, is that you've already allocated, I think it's what, $315 million mm -hmm. um, to this. So mm -hmm. it's not like we're making an insignificant um, investment in this. <laughs> that is the interesting issue that we have because we are in rather flush times. We have been able to um, fund the current the current year's expectation. If this had been a different time, we would have been so struggling to find an additional hundred million dollars to put to this obligation. It would have been heartbreaking, the sort of choices that we would be forced to be making. And I, so I think clearly this is an attempt to avoid those heartbreaks further out. 
that when when we know this these times of one time money are going to be gone in two or three years and we're going to be back to the time of having a um, structural gap between rev revenues and expenditures that is continuing to grow. Um, we, 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 we cannot keep dedicating an increasing amount of our general fund dollars to just paying for um, pension obligations. We were at below 10%, we are now at over, over 11% in our general fund dollar obligation to the pension. And it's just plain unsustainable. And so the question is, how do we fairly to the people who work for the state of Vermont, how do we protect their interests but also how do we protect the interests of all Vermonters um, so that we can continue delivering the, the services that those employees who work for us and our teachers desperately want to be delivering to folks. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a delicate balancing act. Um, folks, I'm, so we're at 10 of, not, of 10. Um, we, there is action on the floor. I want to honor that. I see hands. I, I know that we're going to continue having a conversation. I think we need to kind of continue understanding the bill before we even figure out where we are with regard to our position on it. Um, hand went down and I wasn't trying to ask you not to ask questions. I'm just doing a check in here. Representative Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, a Representative Gannon, I noticed on one of the pages that the VPIC chair will now be receiving a salary equal to not more than one third of the treasurer's salary. Um, are we sure that we're not actually establishing a new state employee by doing this in a, some type of de facto manner? Uh, Representative Fagan, um, actually, that is not new language. Um, that only moved over from 3VSA Section 523 to Section 3VSA 522. Um, he's already s getting a salary of one third of the treasurers. Okay. However, I will say um, the bill does ask for a compensation study um, with respect to the chair. Um, uh, you know, in some of the testimony we heard with respect to other states and how they set up their, their pension offices, um, we, we do want to know whether we're fairly compensating the chair or not. Um, it is a very difficult job. Um, you know, we are very lucky to have Tom Galanka as chair of VPIC. I mean, I think he is really responsible for the turnaround um, with respect to our investment performance in the last couple of years and with respect to, to setting a conservative assumed rate of return. Um, so we do want to look at that. Okay, thank you. And then one more question. Um, does VPIC have the authority? Certainly they, they ought to have the responsibility, but do they have the authority to send the, the, uh, the two bargaining elements back to the table if, the, if, a, uh, if a proposed contract um, has an increase to benefits or a change to benefits that are not funded in the contract? In other words, causing there to be more um, unfunded liability in the funds and, and also damage or also impacting the fiduciary responsibilities of the, uh, of the, uh, the trustees in the commission? Um, neither the current um, VPIC statute nor this bill would give VPIC the authority to, to send back, um, I guess, collective bargaining changes that might impact their decisions. So, I mean, the decisions of VPIC are very basically two in nature. One, one is investing um, the pension funds and two is setting the assumed rate of return. And with respect to those, I'm not totally sure how any um, collective bargaining changes. Um, that nobody working today? Impact um, those decisions. Um, okay, so um, my concern of course is, is this. Um, if you have an increase in benefits, but because of that increase in benefits, uh, the, the unfunded liability immediately grows, 
Um, I've been a part of a pension board that, that had the responsibility to kick it back to the, uh, to the negotiating table. We did, and they renegotiated. Um, it, does the commission have the ability to, to make a recommendation that this be, uh, that this be taken in, that this be put into statute, this type concept be put into statute? Um, the, the bill does not contemplate that at this moment. But do they have the, do they, does the commission have the ability to go where, where it feels is appropriate if it needs, it, it thinks that this is a material aspect that needs to be addressed? I, I, I'm having, I don't think so, no. Yeah. Um, I, I will say, I mean, I understand what you're saying because if, if unfunded, well, not really unfunded liabilities, unfunded liabilities increase and the funding ratios to the teachers or state employees go down. Um, it, it does impact how VPIC will have to invest its money. Um, the lower the funded ratio, the more liquidity um, it needs um, with respect to its pension investments. So it would change the way it invests its money if the funded ratio becomes too low. And we did hear testimony from the chair of VPIC um, and I think that the treasurer that there is a point um, where the funding ratio gets so low that basically you're in a death spiral um, because you're having to, to pump out so much money in benefits um, that you really have to be in investment of vehicles that are very liquid and probably have very low returns. Thank you. Um, Representative Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just wanting to double check. Uh, once we have a chance to have all of our respective questions um, answered with regard to the bill per se, we will, yes, have a chance to walk through the uh, fiscal note? Yes, yeah. Um, so we've been engaged in, in broadly trying to understand the bill. Um, I had thought that you all would have some desire to be on the floor, um, given the, two, the bills that are being considered there. Um, so I wanted us to have the broad overview. Our good folks, friends from Ledge Council and JFO have been patiently sitting here. And my thought was maybe we should go to the floor um, and then come back, um, hopefully late morning, and maybe we can walk through the fiscal note and um, in, it, it, with Ledge Council if you need to go through the bill per se. Um, Teresa is going to come on and tell us if that works or not. I want to remind you that we also have the um, child advocate bill, which we sent away and it has now come back to us and we're taking testimony on that this afternoon and with the intention of garnering enough information to make a decision on Tuesday to vote that bill out. And our intention is also to move this bill out on Tuesday. Um, so let's see where we all are um, by, by noon um, and we can figure out kind of how to proceed here. Um, let, me, let me just add, so we've got the child advocate bill at 130, 115, something like that, one. Um, and um, then we can also take time after that um, to come back to this. So can we stay flexible? Is that, that's okay. Um, I, I'm seeing us running out of steam in terms of our questions for Representative Gannon and LeClaire. And so maybe we can say thank you for this. Um, and um, you're welcome to sit with us, but you're, I, I, I think we're done thinking about this portion of the bill right now. Um, Teresa, what are you trying to tell me? Oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm listening intently. So oh, okay. <laughs> to figure out what the plan is. What, what's next? Okay. And so I, I, I need to, I think 
my only concern is uh, Becky and Chris's yeah. schedule yeah. and yeah. what they're capable. I, I think they're okay this morning, but if we jump to this afternoon, yeah. I'm not. You guys are capable sure. of anything, right? So Chris, how's your schedule? Can you, and, and Becky, can you guys come back um, around 11-ish? Uh I, I can make that work. I need to jump over to Senate transportation for a little bit, but I'll be free late Go morning. back and forth, yeah. Um, and, and I'm also free. Yeah. I'm also free late uh, late morning. I do the afternoon I, I have, yeah. I am scheduled. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ms. Wasserman, as you know, we're, we're not used to actually doing bill walkthroughs. It's kind of a strange concept for us to look at words. Um, and so committee, do you need a um, kind of a traditional walkthrough from ledge council? I, I'm, I'm feeling no. Um, so I think we've, see, we're so easy. It's a little scary, isn't it? Um, I can so, still be here for questions though. Okay, yeah. terrific. And, be working to <laughs> great thank you okie doke um so let us go to the floor um let us um well actually why don't we is anybody monitoring the floor do you know what's going on there do you want to be there now we were talking about S88 when I checked in with somebody, but I don't know if they passed out the other two bills or whether they started with S88. Okay, I, I we could ask Chris to walk us through the fiscal note right now is what I'm, let's do that. Okay, let's do fiscal note right now. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Mr. Roop. Um, pleasure. Yeah, we, we, we've actually not attended at all to the kind of appropriation details in this bill and there are some. And so if you'll help us understand those, please. Sure. Um, Ma Madam Chair, would you prefer that I share my screen or can everybody bring it up on their secondary devices? We, we like um, secondary devices, including paper. So very, no screen share. Very good. Um, the, the fiscal note is uploaded on the JFO website. Um, so I attempted to, to summarize in some bullet points, sort of the top line um, fiscal impacts here. Um, and, and I'll spend some time just sort of briefly going over those. Um, you know, it, expanding the membership of VPIC from seven to 10 members um, adds two additional public members who would be entitled to per diem and expense reimbursement. So, you know, that, that is a pretty small fiscal impact, but I did add it in here and estimated it at about $250 a meeting when you, when you factor in what the per diem and, and estimated expense reimbursements could be. You know, working from working in a remote environment may change realistically what your, what your expense reimbursements are because um, people tend to be incurring fewer expenses when they're working at home. But um, overall, the, the impact of adding those members is rather de minimis, and uh, VPIC, to, you know, they don't meet every single month, but they meet roughly monthly. Sometimes they might meet twice a month. So, you know, this doesn't translate into a very significant fiscal impact by adding these two public members. And with all of the expenses related to VPIC, um, their costs are paid by the, the assets of the respective retirement funds that they um, manage, and uh, those costs are assessed based in proportion to those assets. Um, section three of the bill requires uh, a governance study um, to, to take a look at VPIC's current uh, operations in a relationship with the, the treasurer's office and propose, uh, you know, what would it take to sort of spin them off and become a, a more independent um, entity? That study is already underway um, right now. It's in its earliest stages. Um, I spoke to the treasurer's office. They expect this cost will be, you know, way less than $100,000. I don't think they've exactly had the bill yet, but this is codifying into statute what they're already doing. So um, this does not represent, you know, an additional cost um, above and beyond uh, what they're currently doing. So sections four, six, and eight of the bill. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Roop, 
it, and so they are a, those costs associated with that analysis is already being covered by existing budgets or Correct. evidently out of the retirement system. So correct. that's not a new cost to us. That's correct. Thank you. So sections four, six, and eight of the bill, and, and they all amend different statutes, but they're all, they all pertain to the different uh, three retirement systems. Uh, those are the provisions that increase the frequency of the experience studies from every five years to every three years. Uh, you know, that, that means that over a 30 year period, you'd be doing four more experience studies than you would be otherwise. You know, if you're on a, a five year cycle, you'd be doing six over 30 years. If you're on a three year cycle, you'd be doing 10. So um, most recently, uh, they performed experience studies and, and the costs ended up being um, for, for each of those studies in the ballpark of uh, $25,000, give or take a few thousand. And I added those numbers later in the fiscal note. Um, you know, and again, those are paid from, from the respective retirement funds. So, you know, adding these additional studies will, will translate into a rather small impact on a year-to-year -year basis, a um, few thousand dollars. Um, but, you know, adding, adding four more studies over a 30-year period, you know, if you project out from those current, from those current recent costs, you know, you're looking at anywhere from 96,000 to 112,000 of extra costs per system over a 30 year period. And, and again, these are subject to inflationary pressures. And since these studies are done through professional service contracts that have to be, you know, RFP and renewed on a periodic basis, you know, there's some unknown cost growth that will happen from year to year. But, um, you know, it, and, and it's really hard to project these things out over a 30 year time horizon. But we're not looking at very, very significant changes in the context of funds that have billions of dollars of assets. Um, and, and quite frankly, the, the experience study cost estimates we got from the Treasury's office were less than I thought they would be. Um, pivoting over to the task force um, at the top of page two, um, you know, the 15 member task force, most of the expenses that are envisioned um, would be per diem and expenses um, for the respective members. Um, for the legislative members, um, the, the estimate uh, that our team arrived at was roughly $20,000 that would, that would fall to the budget of the General Assembly. Um, most of those costs would fall into FY22, but since the, the first meeting would be convened in FY21, um, you know, it, by, by June 15th, you know, there will be some proportion of expenses that would fall in FY21. Um, I've been told that those costs uh, will likely be able to be absorbed in the existing General Assembly budget for, and, and the bill contemplates uh, paying for the per diems and expenses for those six legislative members to come out of the General Assembly's budget. For the uh, public members on the committee that are not state employees, the budget contemplates um, assessing those expenses to the budget of the state treasurer. We expect those will be you know, in the ballpark of about $11,000 or so because the per diem rate is lower. Um, than for the legislative members. And again, this would be an area where you'd have some costs fall in FY21, but most of it would fall in FY22, depending on the, based on the timing of the meeting schedule. And, and if, if the meetings are still being performed in a remote environment, it's likely that, um, you know, reimbursable expenses are probably gonna be a little bit less than we're, we're accustomed to uh, estimating and budgeting for based on historical data. Um, the most significant fiscal impact here that, that I think is, that is new would be um, section 10 of the bill right toward the very end calls for an appropriation of up to $200,000 from the general fund for contracted advisory services to support the work of the task force. So this would be the actuarial services that Representative Gannon mentioned, legal services, and any other sort of contracted um, advisory services that, that may be needed to support the work. I think it's, it's envisioned that we could add on to the existing contracts for the existing actuary um, it's, it's much more cost efficient to use the existing actuary who is already, already has our data loaded into their computers. They already have our models. They understand our system. Um, so it's much easier to, to sort of ask them to do additional work and pay them for that work than to go out and try to bring another actuary in and, and bring them up to speed and everything else. So I think that's, that's the arrangement that's contemplated there. The bill does not specify where that $200,000 appropriation should live in terms of a department. But it does uh, specify, um, you know, supporting supporting the work of the task force with two hundred thousand dollars from the general fund. So those are that's the high level overview of um, the fiscal impacts. I have more detail further down in the note that just arrives at some of the methodology and and some 
uh, statutory citations. And, you know, I'm happy to go into that in further detail if anybody would like, but I tried to, tried to keep this uh, rather high level so you could, you could get the main summary from looking at the first two pages. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kim, uh, Jessup. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Root, before, maybe you were already on the call, I was curious about the actuary and uh, Rep Gannon mentioned um, a possibility of doing an audit. And again, I don't pretend to have any expertise of this, but if there were to be any tweak to that section, um, that any additional costs would, would be on that 200,000 here in section 10. And it would be difficult to predict what that range might be because I'm obviously being incredibly vague right now. <laughs> right. No, I, I think you're correct. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, an actuarial audit might might take a little longer than than the, the task force's work is envisioned. Uh, I think the actuarial work that the task force would be realistically asked to do, uh, ask them to do would be model out different scenarios. So what would be what would the impact be if we change this benefit provision or, you know, if if people would like to see what a new plan for new hires would look like, what how do you cost that out? And what would the normal cost be? And, you know, is that more or less expensive than the current plan? So I think that's the type of work um, we would envision that the task force would most frequently be asking the actuary to model out. And it all comes down, you know, the actual cost comes down to how complex is the work and, and how much time does it take? So if, if you can build off sort of their existing models, that cost will be much lower than um, giving them something that's, that's, you know, a complete blank slate or, or, or asking them to work back to arrive to a number. If we say, Here, here's a scenario we want you to project out forward, that is a much easier thing for them to do than to say, you know, here's a number, tell us what we need to do to back into it. Okay. Representative Townsend. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Root, just double checking with regard to the the two references to section 10 for the task force, the three figures, there's the 20,000, the 11,000, and the 200,000. Is the bottom line source for those three amounts, the general fund? I believe so, yes. And I, I think that the first two numbers you threw out are, are likely able to be absorbed through existing appropriations. They're not they're not particularly large amounts, but the yeah the two hundred thousand dollars for the professional services was the the bill stipulates um, general fund. Thank thank you. Other questions for Mr. Roop. Another piece of this bill is the contemplation of. Uh, creating VPIC as an independent organization. Right now, it is housed under in the treasurer's office. Um, what we're going to get a recommendation, I believe, on how to think about that. that you know, forgetting. Yeah, it, yeah, Madam Chair, that's part of the the governance study that um, it, it, it's stipulated in the bill, but that work is already underway right now. Um, VPIC has begun that work um, on their own initiative to take a look at, you know, what, what, would, mm -hmm. what would be entailed with spinning off their operations to be an independent entity. So um, I, I noted in the fiscal note that since that's already underway and we're just sort of, this bill would just sort of codify right. that into statute and formally ask them to do it, that it doesn't represent an additional cost above and beyond what they're already doing. But I think that the results of that study would inform what future costs may be to, to ultimately spin them off to, to an independent entity. Thank you, and, and that's where I'm going is what, uh, so it is thinking that there could be an independent office. And so we need to be aware that we may be supporting creating an additional cost at a later date. Um, and just remind me, so this, this governance study is ongoing. Are we likely to see the creation of this as an independent organization in 22 so, or is that 23? Th that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the answer on, on the timing. I think the study is in its earliest stages, um, but it is underway. 
Um, I'm not sure when they expect it to be done. Um, one, one point I just want to note is, um, you know, currently under the statute, VPICS expenses are assessed back to the retirement funds that they manage. So, um, they, you know, the general fund really doesn't support their operations the way, you know, it would if it was, if it was some other entity or, or independent entity. So, you know, I, I'm sure that the report will address that, but um, whenever we're looking at what, what the costs may be to, to support VPIC as a freestanding entity, those costs would fall to, would, would be assessed in proportion to the assets they manage. So therefore we would be creating an additional cost to those funds. I, I think we would need to understand what that cost would be. I'm teasing, I'm <laughs> being amused by this. Okay. Um, I can sit with that. Other other questions with regard to the fiscal note, folks. Anything else you need to know in order, you know, so they're very broad and interesting policy questions before us, thinking about our role on the appropriations committee. What do you need to know from just an appropriation standpoint in order to make a decision on this bill? Um, do you need additional information um, related to this? Representative Fagan? Thank you. No, I'm good with the information. I'm, I, I think we are, we're, we're darn close here. The only issue, and, and uh, Chris Root brought it up earlier, the $200,000 for, the, uh, for the, the contract support for the actuary and legal assistance is not really, um, um, we haven't directed it to any entity. And I would recommend that we direct that to the treasurer's office. Uh, that's my that's my initial thinking. Maybe Rep. Gannon can give give me a thumbs up or a uh, 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 sign, you know, to let me know if uh, if uh, that uh, was kind of in line with their thinking as well. Uh, Representative Fagan, that that could be one place to put it. Um, it makes sense. I mean, it, I, I would agree. I think it does make sense. Other than that, having read the bill and read the fiscal note, I don't see anything else we need to really amend. Okay, I'm just looking to the rest of the committee. Um, we, we do need to think about where we're getting $200,000. Remember that usually is an issue. Um, okay, so with that, why don't I, shall we adjourn? And I guess I'm hearing you say you don't need additional information. So I see you made up, uh, so we don't, necessarily have to come back uh, together again before this afternoon. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, Representative Townsend. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies for not having been quicker with finding my little hand icon. Um, it, I'm circling back to that issue of uh, where to house the $200,000. Um, is do we need to be um, uh, inquiring or anything or being sensitive in any way with regard to the treasurer's office and and just saying that's where it would be housed? It, I, I, I ask that given that I believe I heard conversation in listening to discussions in in GovOps that the uh, the treasurer was wanting some distance from, from the work of the task force. Do I remember that correctly? Uh, yes, Representative Townsend, I think that is somewhat correct. Um, but with that said, I mean, the treasurer has been very involved um, with uh, working on VPIX governance and, and supports um, the recommendations um, that are in this bill. Um, with respect to the task force, I think um, she wanted, uh, you know, some distance. And this $200,000 is supporting the work of the task force. Yes. So a recommendation could be it be with the treasurer and alternative recommendation is that it could be with the legislature um, we are essentially a convener of the task force by passing this legislation if we do. Um, so that's another place to put yeah. it. 
One of the other questions that we haven't asked ourselves that I'll come back to because there are other hands here. Uh, Rep Feltis? Well, I was just gonna suggest JFO as the source of the $200,000 since they are supposed to be giving technical assistance to the task force anyway. Ask them to make the contracts as requested. Yeah. Um, Yes, another another alternative. Um, Representative Shy. Yeah, just quickly, and I I kind of like uh, Rep. Feltis's suggestion of JFO. I'm just have a quick process question: is in terms of are we voting this out today or next week or what's our timeline? Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the things this task force says that, I mean, the creation of the task force says that technical assistance is provided to JFO and the Office of Legislative Operations. Um, it, it, normally we're very careful and would be asking JFO and Leg Council or Leg Operations if they are able to do this. Very frequently we say, oh, JFO can do it and their list is too long. Did you have this conversation with, um, J uh, with both Ledge Counts or Ledge Ops and um, Le JFO Rep Gannon about their capacity to do this work? Um, I, I don't think we did. I, I mean, I think um, with respect, well, I think, I think Chris, I mean, we've talked with Chris about his capacity to handle the work. Um, and he has been um, always available to our committee um, when we've needed him to, to deal with um, many of the complex issues um, that underlie this bill. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think maybe Chris can speak to that better than I can. Yeah, if I, if I may, Madam Chair, I, I believe, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to help. However, though, I certainly don't speak for JFO. I do think this is going to have to be a team effort in order for it to be successful. So, you know, I think, you know, realistically, regardless of what is said in, in the wording of the statute, um, it's going to be an all hands on deck effort, um, you know, th throughout all the offices of the legislature, as well as the treasurer. And, you know, the, the language also does stipulate that, that the treasurer's office would be providing a level of assistance um, to the effort as well. Um, which would mirror what um, what past practice has been with uh, prior task forces that have looked at pension issues. I, I appreciate that. I, um, I personally believe this is a high, a, a high level priority for the legislature, but we need to be very cognizant of capacity of staff to be able to do this work. Rep uh, um, Ms. Wasserman, I, 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 I don't want to put staff, either Mr. Rook or you, on in an awkward place, but has there been a conversation within your shop about supporting this, or can you direct us to whom we should speak? Um, yeah, I think uh, this, um, I think the supervisors and ledge council and um, also ledge operations would be the best yeah. people okay. to speak to. Um, so I just want to say that the bill is does not specifically say Ledge Council. It's, it's right. um, asking for the committee support services from legislative operations. So I can't really speak to their capacity to do that. Um, and right now, it is just asking for the for sort of fiscal assistance from JFO. And I think it was mostly contemplating a lot of the assistance coming from the treasurer's office. Um, in terms of contracting, um, kind of just going along with what Chris said, I think realistically you can you can put JFO, but I know I, I, I draft the most of the contracts for the legislature. And if it's done with JFO, it is definitely sort of a, a group effort between mm -hmm. us to get that done. So I guess realistically it is it is um, an additional task for alleged council to to um, be drafting those contracts if that's what um, is being asked. So I think I think um, maybe for Chris and I it would be better if you know Steve and yeah. Jen and Mike and Mike Ferrat, Michael Grady and Mike Ferrat were the ones who spoke to capacity. Okay. 
Thank you. I think that's wise. It's not fair to put you all in that position. I just don't want us to assume that, oh, this will happen. Um, and so this, I, so I'm imagining that there is a thought that we will just, um, we need to be, you know, somebody needs to be setting up Zoom meetings and sending out meeting invitations and all of that. And that's one sort of work, but there is additional work uh, perhaps of research and um, a, a, a different type of work. And so, which I, again, is what, um, legislative operations, et cetera, as well as JFO provide. Rep. Gannon, had you thought, would this task force need specific assistance, um, you know, a dedicated per staff person over the course of it? I mean, I just don't want to hobble you by not having provided the, the proper level of support to make this work well. Right. No, that, that's a great question, Madam Chair. I, I want to say two things. First of all, I mean, you mentioned research. So one of the things that $200,000 for the task force to do is to hire a le outside legal counsel. Um, and that will be to assess any legal issues around benefit changes. Um, and assess. So as far as that type of work goes, um, that's contemplated to be done by outside counsel. Um, with respect to legislative counsel staffing, um, the, the task force, I do think, based on my experience in sitting on various um, legislative summer study groups, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah, okay. So let's just, again, I, we just need to put our brains around that a wee bit to make sure we're properly supporting it. Representative Iacoboni? I don't want to assume anything, but is there a way to uh, front the money and then to recoup it through some kind of a bill back through state government and thereby get the federal participation to help us on this. I'd be surprised if the 200,000 is enough, but that's, you know, I see you smiling, Madam Chair. I think well, I just, that, I that love, you. you see, this is oh, what we're supposed to do. How to stretch dollars. How well, to well, $1 turn <laughs> into $2. <laughs> it's a design of a fringe benefit the way I look at it, <laughs> and, and, the, and the departments pay the fringe benefits of all the staff, just like they pay HR, yeah. they pay for, for that, but maybe it's a stretch, maybe JFO could advise us, I don't know. Yeah, okay, we, we can put some more there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, others? Not seen any, shall we? Uh, shall we I'm not thinking of any, any stone that we haven't picked up. Um, so shall we go to the floor, be back here? Um, I keep forgetting, is it at one or 1.15? Must be 1.15, our usual time. Child advocate, we one, need to- One o'clock. One o'clock, okay, one o'clock. Go to the floor, be back here at one o'clock, be ready to, with the new bill on the child advocate, so it's going to look different than what we have seen. Um, and the need to take all the testimony we can on that so that you're prepared to make a decision and vote it out on Tuesday morning. Um, and then we'll have more conversations about the pension bill. But again, to be clear, the intention is to also move the pension bill out on, on Tuesday. So be thinking so that we're ready to do that. Anything else? Uh, uh, Representative Harrison. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, earlier, there were some comments made about, you know, putting additional bumper guards as to the pension bill, any changes we could do. Uh, and I, I'm very, very sympathetic to them. However, I guess in this case, I would encourage us to um, look at what House GovOps did and not tie the hands of the task force. Uh, you know, arguably nothing should be exempt, but uh, certainly we wanna protect re 
current retirees um, uh, in our hearts. Uh, so, and, and not give them angst that we're going to change anything. So uh, I, I would have GovOps has done, um, has not had an easy task. Uh, I, I have to tell you, um, you know, I was probably happy at times that I was no longer on GovOps, uh, uh, especially when I was watching those public hearings. Um, so um, I would encourage us to, you know, do whatever we can to endorse their hard work. Uh, this is not a done deal. This is going to be an ongoing conversation. Uh, and we are going to be dealing with this issue next January, uh, one way or another. So um, uh, let's uh, let's continue the conversation, and hopefully, we get something done. Thank you. So thank you for that. And uh, so there was a suggestion that some bumpers be put around the analysis. And there was also a suggestion that we that um, there should also be an analysis of other benefits and the um, uh, compensation structure of the entire system. And similarly, I think it would be wise to not go down that er area also. Um, we can all think of ways that we would try to manage the system differently. But if we put all of those ways on the table now, we will get nothing done. And I think what, what GovOps has tried to do is to discreetly state a problem to be solved and not allow other problems to trickle into the resolution of what I hope we regard just from a straight appropriation standpoint of a, a, a profound issue with the increasing cost of pensions crowding out or crowding the work that our dollars have to do across the board um, in needing to attend to that. Um, Rep LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just be quick. I agree with the member from uh, Chittenden, with the exception of, I think we should maybe take a look at the current retirees and the teachers fund, maybe just exclusively from Chittenden County, however. <laughs> Ooh, um, what? A, there, there's some payback that will happen yeah. there. Um, Rep. Yacovoni. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, what the member from Chittenden said, and I appreciate your comments too, Madam Chair, but to some um, moral issues um, need to be addressed. And I, I personally feel if someone has committed much of their work life in service to the state, I would be complicit if I were silent. So I may, I may realizing it may not be successful, I may offer a guardrail amendment and I hope that's not disrespectful. It's just something I feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Rep Gannon, remind us of what the conversation in your committee and I think what I understood you to say the intentions were that of, of holding um, harmless, um, let, so rather than trying to put words, you tell us what the conversation was. There's an initial um, proposal on the table, which uh, reduced benefits in some cases. Um, two of our goals were not to harm existing retirees and not to harm folks within five years of retirement. Um, and, and I will say to um, sort of address some, some of these questions around guardrails, I think there are a lot of legal constraints or restraints on touching retiree benefits. Um, and, and Becky Wasserman may be able to talk about that. Um, with respect to people within five years of retirement, I think that was just, you know, us acting in good faith um, because we do not want to um, impact people that are close to retirement who are already making decisions about how to spend those benefits. Okay. Thank you. Um, so perhaps we'll have a continuing conversation about, about that. Um, 
which is good. That's exactly what we're trying to identify right now. Okie doke, folks. Um, anything else that the people need to raise? And I really am looking for asking you to say, these are the substantive issues that I need to have resolved in order to uh, make a decision on this bill at, from an appropriations committee standpoint. Not seen any. Okay, let us go to the floor and then back here at one. Will you take us off live, Teresa?